All right, welcome in everybody. Let's do some accident analysis today on November 273 Sierra Mike. This was a Guardian air ambulance flight that crashed just outside of Stagecoach, Nevada back in February of 2023. This is the accident aircraft. <clears throat> say a 2002 PC-1245 Legacy and uh, this is the some of the wreckage here you can see the NTSB looking over the wreckage there and a field just outside of Stagecoach and unfortunately all five occupants perished in the crash there was a pilot a med crew of two and two passengers a patient and a family member that perished in the crash the aircraft was destroyed and let's see if we can uh, figure out what happened here and maybe learn some lessons. So this is the Aviation Safety Network page about the accident with the NTSB preliminary report. And um, the aircraft took off from Reno Tahoe International Airport en route to Salt Lake City International Airport at night. There was some snow in the area and uh, some adverse weather. The aircraft took off and climbed into the clouds <clears throat> presumably encountered some ice and turbulence, and then crashed shortly after departure. So if I scroll down here, we can take a look at the ADSB flight track data. So you can see here's the airport at Reno Tahoe International Airport. The aircraft took off on 17 left, climbed out on the Zephyr departure procedure, <clears throat> made a left-hand turn at uh, this waypoint, EPOS, and they were on the blackjack transition. So they made the left turn at EPOS, left turn at WIT, they were en route to DAT waypoint and the crash occurred just around DAT. And so on the uh, ADSB track data, we can see that here. So left turn at EPOS, left turn at WIT, and then en route to DAT, the aircraft veered right, of course, and the loss of control ensued. And this down here is a zoomed in picture at this last spiral, <clears throat> a steep spiral, and there was an in-flight breakup according to the India NTSB. The uh, horizontal stabilizer and a section of the right wing were found about three quarters of a mile away from the main wreckage, so there was an in-flight breakup that did occur. <clears throat> uh, so very unfortunate accident. Um, so let's talk about the weather at the time. On the west coast in the winter time, uh, if there as a weather system moving through, you can get some pretty bad ice and turbulence, which was the case this night. The uh, Oakland Center controller advised the pilot of light to moderate turbulence in the area during the climb. The aircraft never made it above about 19,000 feet. I think the accident sequence started uh, right around 19.3 or was it 19.1, but just above flight level 19 or 0 is when uh, the pilot lost control and entered this uh, steep spiral here. There you go, 19.1. Oh no, sorry, they, well, it looks like they made it up all the way to 19.4. So um, they were climbing through some turbulence in IMC at night over mountainous terrain and presumably in icing conditions, although we'll have to wait until the final report comes out to verify that, but there were advisories for icing in effect. And anytime you have upslope winds in the mountains like that, if you have enough moisture in the wintertime, you can get some pretty bad ice over the mountains. So. It looks like probably what happened was as the aircraft was climbing, <clears throat> it was accumulating ice and probably, um, I'm guessing, and this is just me guessing at this point, again, we'll learn more perhaps in the, in the final report, but they probably stalled somewhere right around here and um, the pilot lost control, attempted to regain control, and then the aircraft suffered an in-flight breakup. So you can see here, um, it looks like the autopilot was engaged as it should have been, as it would have been. Um, and the aircraft was flying along the Zephyr departure. <clears throat> so right here, as the aircraft veered to the right, of course, is obviously when the, the pilot started having problems. So either the autopilot disconnected because uh, of the turbulence <clears throat> or um, perhaps the aircraft started to, uh, to, to wobble or stall in that area as a result of the ice accumulation on the, on the airframe and the pilot disconnected the autopilot and started to hand fly the airplane and then uh, the rest of the accident sequence ensued. Uh, we don't know yet. So uh, anytime that you're flying in icing conditions, especially if you're flying in significant icing conditions, a moderate or, or you know, hopefully you're not flying in severe icing for 
um, for very long. You're trying to flee that icing condition as soon as you're into it. But um, you, you really want to either hand fly the airplane or if you're going to use the autopilot, you at least want to monitor the trim positions very closely uh, because the autopilot is going to be running trim against any effects from the ice. So if you're, have, if you're seeing a, an abnormal trim application, that's a big red flag that you're getting a lot of ice on the airplane. You can also disconnect the autopilot and hand fly the airplane temporarily just to get a feel for the controls to see if the controls feel sluggish or if they feel you know, um, different than they normally would. Again, that's a big red flag that you're getting a lot of ice on the airplane and you need to take action fast to get out of that icing condition. So uh, we're not sure exactly what happened here with this initial veer off course, but um, Clearly, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that the pilot did start to hand fly the aircraft at some point in here <clears throat> and then lost control. So either the pilot clicked the autopilot off or the autopilot disconnected on its own. Um, now, when you get ice on the, on the airframe, it does a lot of bad things aerodynamically. First and foremost, it, it destroys lift. It changes the shape of the, of the wing. It also increases drag and it can reduce thrust. And if you get a really big load of ice on the airplane, it can also add weight. So um, airplanes do not like to fly in significant icing conditions. Now the PC-12 is certified for flight into known icing conditions. It does have de-icing boots. It has um, boots, electrical boots on the prop. It has an inertial separator, of course, uh, and uh, PETA, uh, probe heat as well as AOA vein protection. So everything's heated. You have windshield heat. It has everything it needs to fly in icing conditions. And the icing control systems on the airplane work quite well. I've flown the Pilatus in a lot of ice over the years and I've never had a problem. Um, but uh, if you're flying in severe icing conditions, those conditions can overwhelm the ice control systems of any airplane of any size. So there's no telling how bad the ice was this night. <clears throat> um, but first I want to talk about just the go, no go decision to take off out of this airport. This is Reno Tahoe International Airport here. You can see all the high terrain around the Sierra Nevada mountains are just off to the west. Lake Tahoe's out here. <clears throat> this is uh, roughly what their flight track was on the Zephyr departure. Accident occurred right around here north of Highway 50 outside of Stagecoach. So um, it's really easy to Monday morning quarterback these things and say uh, the pilot should not have taken off in these conditions. Uh, I think that's a bit of a cop-out, to be honest. So in the real world of professional flying, especially air ambulance flying, or if you're flying paying passengers or cargo, there will be a lot of situations where you have to fly in less than ideal weather conditions. That's not to say that you should say yes to every flight because you absolutely should not. There is a time and a place to say no, and um, there are conditions that are absolutely not safe to fly in. However, <clears throat> um, I can't say that the pilot really made a bad call taking off into these conditions this night, I think I probably would have taken off into these conditions myself. Now, I don't have a full weather briefing, so I don't know if there were pyre ups of really significant icing in the area or not. I know there was, uh, I think there was an AirMet Zulu for icing, but those, you know, you see those a lot. <clears throat> um, if there was a SIGMET for severe icing, that might change my mind, probably would change my mind, especially when coupled with the nighttime over complex terrain with the turbulence. You're kind of getting risk factors that are adding up that are making you say, eh, maybe we want to stay on the ground. But just simply taking off at night over the mountains in some turbulence and ice, um, that's, dare I say, routine for professional pilots flying in the Intermountain West in the wintertime. Uh, I've done it. It's, you know, anyone that's flown with me knows I'm as safety conscious as they come. I don't take risks that I don't need to take. But um, <clears throat> we can't just always say no to flights anytime that there are, you know, there's a weather system in the area. So flying in, in this type of weather is just part of professional flying. Um, and I don't find fault with the pilot for taking off into these conditions necessarily. Uh, like I said, unless we're, there were some pyre ups of, of really significant icing or something that I'm not aware of. But just simply taking off into, you know, into some uh, turbulence and icing um, like this is kind of par for the course flying in the mountains in the winter time. So I don't think he necessarily made a bad call taking off. <clears throat> now, if I took off into these conditions and I was expecting turbulence and ice, the, you know, what I would want to do is monitor the situation very closely as I'm climbing out and I'm going to be monitoring the ice accretion on the airplane to see how quickly it's accumulating. And if it's accumulating faster than I'm comfortable with after I get up and into the clouds, 
uh, I might think twice about continuing the climb and maybe even return back to, to Reno. Now that's a pretty difficult call to make. Um, after you've taken off to you know, put the tail between the legs and, and, and return back to the, to the departure report, um, is a tough call to make if we're just being honest and being realistic about the human factors involved here. There is a lot of pressure to continue the climb. There's a lot of internal pressure to keep going. That's not to say that's necessarily the correct thing to do, but we just want to <clears throat> we just want to have you know a, a sober idea of the the actual human factors at play when you take off into conditions like this. I'm guessing the pilot was probably noticing the ice and thinking, <clears throat> if I can just keep climbing and get on top, I'll get out of the ice and we'll be home free. And uh, frankly, we've all been there. So uh, in some cases that in most in, in most cases I should say that works just fine. You keep climbing, you're watching the boots shed the ice, and you get up on top, and everything is uh, everything's just fine. So in this case, because of the nighttime conditions, um, <clears throat> it's harder to see the ice accumulation occurring on the airplane, especially in a high workload phase of flight. The takeoff and climb on a departure procedure like this. In IMC in turbulence, the pilot probably had his hands full, and it can be a little bit uh, it can be a little bit easy to forget to look outside as much as you should be to monitor the ice accumulation on the airplane. You can't see it unless you look for it. And in the PC12, we have this little light bulb right here. It's the wing inspection light, and this bulb is only on the left side and it's aimed out and it shines right here on the left leading edge of this wing. And there's a control for it right here on the overhead panel, this wing light. You press that, it turns that light on, <clears throat> and you can look out the window and you can see the ice accumulation on the leading edge of the wing. You can also shine a flashlight out on the wing because this light isn't the brightest. <clears throat> so if you have a bright flashlight, sometimes that's a better thing to do. But in any event, it, you can forget to do that if you have your hands full flying a departure procedure like this. So uh, I'm not sure you know, how closely the pilot was monitoring the ice accumulation. Um, and again, we don't know exactly what factor ice played in the accident, you know, what, what role ice played in the accident, but it's possible that the ice was accumulating faster than he was aware and that he picked up a big load of ice on the airplane. And when you have that much ice on the airplane, the wing is going to stall sooner than it otherwise would. Uh, a clean wing is going to stall at, you know, a, a much lower airspeed than uh, an ice contaminated wing would. So um, my, my guess is that they were climbing and uh, picked up a good load of ice and uh, we don't know the status of the ice control systems. Now, if I'm climbing in icing conditions like that, I'm gonna have everything cooking. So I'm gonna have the prop heat on, I'm gonna have the inertial separator open, that puts the propeller in ice mode so that I'm getting an added protection from the uh, shaker pusher system for stall protection. And I'm also gonna have my, of course, the windshield heat and probe heat are gonna be on at all times, and I'm gonna have the boots on the one minute cycle. So they're just running in the background and they're doing everything they can to shed the ice as I climb. That way, if I'm not able to you know, look outside, it doesn't really matter, I'm doing everything I can to shed the ice anyway. The reason to look outside and monitor the ice accumulation, again, is just to see whether or not I wanna continue this endeavor to try to climb on top of the ice. If you decide you wanna to try to climb on top of the ice, you don't always make it up above the ice. So that is a risk um, and you have to just really monitor the rate of accumulation and make a conservative decision um, and say this is this ice is accumulating faster than I thought, faster than I'm comfortable with. I'm going to go back down and I'm going to return to Reno and uh, we're going to sit this one out. <clears throat> so again, it's a tough call to make. Uh, perhaps would have been the right call to make in this situation. I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, but that's the way that I would uh, that I would handle it. And again, um, <clears throat> what, now once you get into a situation where you have a load of ice on the airplane, the aircraft stalls. The Pilatus, on the best of days, when it stalls, it has a pretty hard break with a lot of roll. So it does not have favorable stall, stall characteristics, which is actually why the aircraft has the uh, shaker pusher system installed. So you don't want to stall a Pilatus. Uh, when we practice stalls, we do it in the sim. I've never actually you know, stalled a Pilatus in the real airplane. The closest I've come in training is just in the actual airplane itself, not in the sim, it is taking it to the pusher, which means the pusher will actually come in, snatch the yoke, and 
push the nose down to prevent the stall because you don't actually want to take a Pilatus to a full stall on the real airplane because you'll roll over. Um, so if that did happen on this flight, <clears throat> uh, they probably rolled pretty aggressively. I'm not sure if this was part of that roll off. I don't know if they started to stall here or what happened here. If he just, you know, the pilot just started to kind of lose control, maybe some spatial disorientation, not sure. But in any event, you know, right here after the loss of control was, um, had fully taken place, um, I have to assume probably there was a stall in here. And again, it could have just been spatial disorientation, we don't know, but I'm guessing the ice plate or, played a factor. And then after you're in that steep spiral, as I mentioned on my last video about the accident that happened um, in uh, Gillette, Wyoming, just last month in July of 2024 here, um, if you pull back on the yoke, you're increasing the, the load factor on the airplane and you can actually cause an in-flight breakup, which is perhaps what happened here. Although if you exceed you know, a certain airspeed, and a spiral like this, even without pulling, you will eventually uh, potentially break the airframe apart. So um, anyway, so lessons learned. Um, <clears throat> starts with a good weather briefing as always. You gotta know what conditions you're, you're taking off into. It can and often is different than what you expect it to be. So after you take off, you know, well, first of all, make a good conservative go, no-go decision. In some cases, you don't want to fly. Um, in professional flying, that's pretty rare in an airplane like the PC-12. And uh, like I said on this night, I've taken off in conditions like these, and um, everybody that, I, you know, all, all of the colleagues that I have um, have as well. So I don't think you made a bad call taking off into the conditions. I think if I had a good weather briefing and I knew the ice was going to be a significant concern, <coughs> excuse me, I would, um, you know, just have my ice control systems cooking up here and then I would also be um, I'd probably just leave my wing inspection light turned on throughout the climb and I'd be looking out there at that uh, left leading edge very frequently uh, just to monitor the ice accumulation and if it were you know accumulating faster than I was comfortable with I would turn around I hope <laughs> I hope I would turn around and go back to Reno so um, this is a scary one, guys. Uh, I can't really say he did anything wrong, um, you know, other than, like I said, maybe not going back to Reno, but that's a tough call to make. So, um, you know, this is why we just have to um, stay up on our training, be as vigilant as we can and, and make, you know, conservative decisions and um, just do our best to, to manage risk. All right, guys, hope you learned something. Uh, I am hosting a boot camp, uh, Pilatus PC-12 Systems boot camp, starting August 25th. If you're interested in that, uh, it's going to be a live stream every Sunday for five weeks through September 22nd. Uh, if you want to attend or just have access to the recordings of the class, all you need to do is join the channel, click the join button, and uh, pay the $4.99 to join, and you'll have full access to the class. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.